What is that? What? What's inside of there? Let's dig it up. Should I get a shovel too? <sighs> How do we get the lid off? Okay. Look under here. What? <sighs> Ooh, yuck. <sighs> now look, there's little screws. <sighs> All right, buddy. Oh, baby, yeah. Okay. I'm opening it. Okay, give it that. Okay. Let's open the swapping paper. <gasps> Turn his head around. How did he? Look! Is that your bed now? Is no. that where you go to sleep? No. Are you a vampire? No. I'm not. <laughs> This morning I uploaded part two of the Neistat Brothers respectability tour. Uploaded it to Patreon. And it's sort of Hunter S. Thompson meets Dumb and Dumber in Aspen. It's probably my favorite thing that Casey and I made together. It's just all, it's all just right. And it was the prototype for the Neistat Brothers HBO series. Casey Neistat, Van Neistat, and Ariel Shulman. <laughs> <laughs> Do you hear this sh <laughs> Do you hear him? It's so funny. <laughs> All right, ready? And Ariel Shulman has a movie premiering this Friday night on Paramount Plus and probably in the theaters too, and it's called Secret Headquarters. It's great. I went to a screening of it last week. And so watching this video, the respectability tour, and doing the director's commentary, I had this feeling of nostalgia, which I'm feeling a lot lately. And it's a new feeling for me because I spent so much of my life in New York City, and New York City is not nostalgic. You know, they tear down their most iconic... Uh, buildings, they tore down, you know, Penn Station, they tore down the Polo Grounds, they're on their second Yankee Stadium, all those victories in the first Yankee Stadium, and they're not Fenway, they tear it down and they build a new one right next to it, and then the year they build the new one, I'm pretty sure they won the World Series that, that year too. So I've always thought to the future and always building things to the future and working in the present to make the best future for myself, but this year of the channel, I do a lot of looking back and I'm experiencing a lot of nostalgia. And nostalgia, the, the, the dictionary definition is homesick, homesickness. Three weeks ago, I scribbled this down. 7-16-22, nostalgia, speak into the camera. Missing New York means missing my friends and missing my friends means missing the times we spent together, and missing those times is nostalgia. And it's hitting me hard. So I've been thinking about nostalgia and I'm wondering what's the purpose? 
what's the evolutionary advantage of nostalgia? Why do we feel nostalgia? Next week, I'm going to New York for the first time in three years. That's the longest stretch I've been away since I've lived there. And I'm bringing my son with me. And when he was first born, I had this dream that's now a broken dream. I won't, this won't happen. I kept this apartment in New York City for 15 years. And it was an SRO apartment, which is single room occupancy, which means you share a bathroom with the rest of the people who have apartments on the same floor. 12 feet. 12 feet. This apartment was tiny. It was 12 feet by 12 feet, 144 square feet. And I called it, one of my girlfriends dubbed it the, the fort because it was kind of like a, the ultimate like tree fort. Because I was there for so long and because it was so small, it became this very dense, essentially like museum installation. It was perfect. It was so, so, so beautiful. And every square inch was accounted for. Every possession that was in there was important. But it was also a 144 square foot apartment where I had to share a bathroom with, you know, 12 other people or however many people lived on the floor. And I was like the bathroom mayor. So I always cleaned it. It was every time if I went to the bathroom and then 30 minutes later, I went to the bathroom again, it was like destroyed. And every time I took a shower, I had to clean the whole bathroom, you know, scrubbing bubbles. I did all the plumbing. I replaced the shower curtain pole, the shower curtains I replaced every time. If I went away for a long time and came back, it would just be ruined. And I'd have to put on like a suit and a respirator and with bleach, just clean this whole thing. So this apartment was a blessing because it was like 400 and something dollars a month, like in 2018. It was also kind of a curse or a golden cage or golden handcuffs because it's not something you let go of, right? And it kind of kept me, maybe it kept me chained in New York. I don't know. I think it actually gave me more opportunities. 2019, 2020, I've got a little baby. I've got this I'm living out west now. I'm living on the razor's edge financially, and I just cannot afford to pay this $400 of rent in New York to maintain this thing, to maintain this apartment, the fort. And I knew letting it go, I knew letting it go would, I'd regret it, but I just couldn't do it. And also letting it go was like letting go of New York too. I'm right now experiencing a little bit of regret that I didn't somehow do something, but it was like, I owed like $10,000 worth of rent or something. I owed like two years worth of rent. And then I don't know what happened with the building, but I got a call. The, the, like the superintendent or the building manager said, oh, we're just, we found this note with this phone number inside the apartment. We're wondering what you're doing with it. And she said, have you moved out? And I just did a quick calculation. If I say, yes, I've moved out, I'm off the hook for 10 grand of, a, of rent, of past rent that I owed. And if I say, no, I haven't moved out, I owe like a couple years worth of rent. So I just said, no, yes, I've moved out. And she was just like, oh, okay, well, um, would you be able to, if we move your stuff out, will you be able to pick it up at some point? And we'll arrange, and can you arrange to have it picked up? And I just said, yes, thinking I, I would be able to. And of course, it's like the pandemic. It might have been right before the pandemic. It might have been during the pandemic. I'm not really exactly sure when it was. It was always, I had never had a lease with this place. It was a single room occupancy. It was subsidized by the government. I don't know, state government. I don't know, city government. It was like the building was for people who were, it was like for poor people. It was for like homeless people. It was for displaced people. And I had just been, I was like an artist who had, I had inherited it from, um, my brother who had inherited it from my ex-girlfriend's cousin who had fled to Brazil after like right after September 11th, 2001. I got it in 2003. Casey had it in, from like 2001 to 2003. So I just, they moved all my stuff out. I mean, I haven't been back. They've moved all my stuff out and they sent me a picture of it, of all my stuff, like in boxes. I could glimpse that they had like torn up the floor of the apartment. Like all the stuff had been out. I laid the floor myself by hand. I brought the boards up from Chinatown Building Supply on the subway, like five boards a night, like 
you know, five or six foot long boards on a little dolly on the subway, like night after night. And then after work, working at, after working at Tom Sachs's all day, I would like, I had to grease the, um, the, the screws I used to screw the wood to the floor so that it wasn't noisy for my neighbors. Cause I was doing this at nighttime. And so I had this dream. I had this dream that I would never talk about it. And then one day I would bring my son to New York and we would just get on the subway and we'd go up to 96th street and we'd walk down the hill now 94th street across West end Avenue into my building and X being like, where are we going? Where are we going? And I would say, Oh, I'm, I'm, you'll see, you'll see. And we would go up into my apartment and I'd put the key in the door and I'd open it and I'd open the door and he'd say, where are we? And I'd say, this is my place. This is my apartment. And I mean, for a kid, he would have been blown away. For a kid, it was like a perfect little kid scale thing. There was a, you know, a little like steps that I had installed to climb up into the loft. And that dream is gone. It's all been dismantled. It's all, I, I regret it in the sense that I wish it, I had been able to keep it. I don't regret it in the sense of I would do the same thing again. I would do it again. I would just, I would surrender the apartment again. So little kids, you know, they go through obsessions. If you have little kids, you know this, or if you don't have kids, maybe you remember this. And the current obsession for my son is cemeteries and graves. When was the last time you were in a cemetery? Cemeteries are incredible because there's so much decency in a cemetery human beings are so decent in a cemetery I see a new plane up there. a new one you know you can just at these cemeteries you can just pull over and park anywhere there's no no parking anywhere you can just park anywhere and everyone respects you if you're in the cemetery even when you're with a little kid a cemetery is the ultimate monument to nostalgia and it's a sacred place and you can feel it easily there was something significant about x bringing me to this place there was something it was like some embedded ancient wisdom in him unintentional he didn't he no he wasn't thinking of me about going to this place at Forest Lawn, most of the graves are flush with the ground. They're just basically plaques. And so we parked at the bottom of this hill and it was all just plaques. And the gold standard for X, he had never seen in real life graves that stick up out of the ground. And that's his gold standard. He's like, is it they have graves that stick up out of the ground? I don't know. I think maybe it's a West Coast thing. I don't know. I don't know why. But they don't really have them here. And so we're at the base of this pretty steep but small hill, we have the car parked, and all of the gravestones are flush with the ground. And so we walk up the hill, we walk up the hill, we walk up the hill, and we get to the summit of the hill, and we look down into the little valley of death, and X is like, they have the graves that are sticking out of the ground. And he was just running through the cemetery. He was so elated and so inspired just running through the cemetery and they had mausoleums and he asked about the skeletons and all the bodies and stuff. And we were picking out our favorites and I noticed this one grave that was far away. It had a little vase, a little white vase next to it. And I said, X, let's go look at that grave. Let's go see what's going on with that grave. And at Forest Lawn, they have all of these rules about the cemetery plots like you can't put certain things on them and flowers are cleared by a certain date and this grave had a bunch of trinkets on top of it like little mementos that people had left and it had a little vase next to it and so we got around and we got to the headstone and it was a you know it was 
it was a pretty nice, decent headstone. Like this person had done something. And I read the name and it was L. Frank Baum. And it was under a tree. It was in the shade. It was like the nicest spot you could have your grave. And you know who L. Frank Baum is because the book that L. Frank Baum wrote was adapted into the movie that more human beings have seen than any other movie in film history. And the name of that book is The Wonderful Wizard of Oz. And I don't know why, but that was like an explosive moment for me. And I said to X, I said, this is the guy, he made the Wizard of Oz. He thought it all up from his head. He just invented it. And he wasn't as excited as I was because he doesn't understand about, <laughs> you know, how movies are made. They probably, they're just real to him. I think I had an epiphany being in that graveyard, being in that cemetery. Nostalgia, I think, serves two purposes. One, it returns us to our people. It encourages us to return to our people if we're far away. And two, this is the, the epiphany I had. And this may be for the older folks. The younger folks watching this might not be able to relate to this. I think we experience nostalgia so that when we have an experience that we know we will be nostalgic about, a, an experience that is going into our nostalgia bank. Our nostalgia, the strength of that feeling of nostalgia, encourages us to surrender to the experience. Nostalgia is a license to surrender to the meaningful experiences in our future. This week on the Patreon, a live stream answering your questions. The link is right there.